Thank you, Jessica, and thank you, everyone, uh, for attending this webinar. This is the first webinar of a series of three where we will be looking at different aspects of cell death. <clears throat> In this session, I will talk to you about the different tools available to study cell viability and proliferation, and to decide which assay is most suitable for your experimental setting. Why it is important to look at cell viability? On one hand, it is essential before doing any cell-based assay to assess whether the cells you are going to use are healthy. And the reason for this is to ensure that the results obtained from the experiment are both reliable and reproducible. So starting your experiment with healthy cells will help you to optimize and standardize cell culture conditions, to avoid experimental artifacts resulting from unhealthy cells, and to improve the accuracy of your results. On the other hand, assessment of viability is also a simple and low-cost method to measure the effects of the stimuli in culture cells, allowing you to spend more time and money in more complicated downstream studies. This arrow represents the balance, the balance of life and death that cells are subjected to. Cells will generally proliferate and divide, and at some point during the cell cycle, the cells will be subjected to stress stimuli, which can be endogenous, like for instance, a cell replication defect, or exogenous, like drug treatment. If the cell cannot repair and overcome this stress, then cells will die. And cells can die in several ways. Um, apoptosis represents a specific and controlled type of cell death. And sometimes there is a confusion between viability and apoptosis assays. And in this table, we try to summarize and clarify what these assays are. So cell viability assays assess how healthy the cells are, whereas apoptotic assays look at how the cells, which we already know are not in a healthy state, are dying. Cell viability assays generally detect markers of cellular activity and they can be used to optimize cell culture conditions, as we just mentioned, or to and to ensure that the cells are happy before any further study or treatment. On the other hand, apoptotic assays detect markers that are activated only upon cell death and are specifically used when we want to detect by which mechanism the cells are dying. It is very important to understand that cell viability and apoptosis assays are not exclusive but complementary. Before we use an apoptosis assay, we will need to use a viability assay because before we try to look at how the cells are dying, we have to make sure how many cells are dead and if our initial sample was in good condition before the experiment started, otherwise our results will not be true. So apoptosis assays and other cell markers will be covered in our next webinar session. So I will focus now on viability assays. When we talk about studying cell viability, we are mainly referring to the ability of a cell to maintain or recover its viability after cell injury, as well as determining how cells are before and after stress stimuli. Researchers generally use viability assays as a common name when talking about viability, proliferation, and cytotoxicity. And although these terms are very interchangeable indeed, as we will show later on the webinar, they refer to slightly different things. Cell proliferation assays are used to monitor the growth rate of a population or to detect specific daughter cells in a growing population. On the other hand, cytotoxicity assays are used to determine the number of live and dead cells in a population after treatment. So these definitions are not mutually exclusive and usually interchangeable, as we just said. And you will see that sometimes the same assay is used to study both proliferation and cytotoxicity. So let's look now in more detail at viability and cytotoxicity assays which for clarity we will just refer from now on as viability assays. 
So buyability assays can roughly be divided into three types. One is what we say called the cellular metabolic activity assay, which is based on the modification, generally by reduction, of a specific dye by cellular or mitochondrial enzymes. Another type is the cytolysis or leakage assay, which is based on the fact that some dyes can only enter or escape cells when the membranes are no longer intact. A slightly different type of assay is cell cycle assay, which allows the visualization of the cell cycle profile. <clears throat> so how does the metabolic activity assay work? The detector molecule is added to the culture media and then enters the live cells. Inside the cell, this detector molecule or dye is generally modified in the cytosol or the mitochondria so that it becomes fluorescent or changes color. And then this change can be detected either by microplate reader, which can be fluorescence or absorbance, or by flow cytometry. So here's a representation of how we visualize the readout. When the dye is added to the culture, if the cell is dead or dying, the enzymes are not functional anymore and there will be lower or no signal. So for cellular metabolic activity assays, a higher signal denotes live cells, whereas a lower signal means dying or dead cells. So here you can see a couple of examples. On the upper panel, you can see jerked cells treated with increasing concentrations of staurosporin during four hours. Staurosporin is a protein kinase inhibitor which is known for inducing cell death and is commonly used as a positive control. The viability of the cells was measured after four hours with our mitochondrial viability stain, where the indicator diet is modified by mitochondrial enzymes. The oxidation product can be measured by absorbance, which produces a pink color, or by fluorescence. In the lower panel, you can see how our colorimetric cell cytotoxicity assay, which has a similar working principle, was used to assess the viability of the neuroblastoma cell line SISI5. The data highlighted here suggests that dopamine reduces cell survival in SISI5 cells independently of alpha synuclein presence. A slight variation of the metabolic assay is the LDH cytotoxicity assay. This assay detects the presence of LDH, the lactate dehydrogenase enzyme, in the cell culture medium. LDH is retained in the cytoplasma in viable cells but it leaks into the culture medium when the cells are dying and the membranes are disrupted. In this case, the probe is not able to enter the cells, so the signal is only produced when the LDH is released into the medium. So I'm now going to talk to you about the cytolysis assay. So how this assay works? The principle is a slightly different depending on whether we use an impermeable or a permeable dye. An impermeable dye will enter the cell only when the cell membrane is broken, and then will diffuse into the nuclei and become fluorescent when it cross-links to the DNA. This type of assay is not compatible with fixation, as the fixation process itself affects the integrity of the cell membranes. So here you can see again the representation of how we visualize the readout. If we add to the cell culture media a dye which is impermeable, and that means that cannot enter the cell if the membrane is intact, we will not see any signal in live cells. However, if the cells are dead, the membranes will be broken and the dye will be able to enter and stain the nucleus. So therefore, in this case, a higher signal denotes dead cells whereas a lower signal means live cells. If we use a permeable dye for this assay, the working principle is almost the opposite of the one we have just seen. So in this case, 
the dye can diffuse freely through the intact plasma membrane into the cytosol, where it is then generally modified by esterases to become fluorescent. Because the fluorescent molecule cannot diffuse back through the membrane, this type of assay is actually compatible with fixation. So you can see here that when we use a permeable dye, we will get a higher signal in live cells. On the contrary, as we've just mentioned, and you can see in the left side, when we use an impermeable dye, we will get a high signal in the dead cells. And here you can see a couple of examples for each of these type of dyes. On the apple panel, it shows jerked cells treated with increasing concentrations of etoposite, which is a topoisomerase 2 inhibitor. In this case, we have used our life and death cell assay to assess the number of life and death cells at the same time. The live cell dye, which is a green dye, is membrane permeable and can enter the live cells, where it is retained and becomes fluorescent. The death cell dye, which is a red dye, is only able to enter cells that have disrupted membranes. So this is a very simple and efficient method to look at both life and death cells at the same time in the same population. Because this assay uses a death cell dye is not compatible with fixation. In the lower panel, you can see joycut cells treated with staurosporin or heat and stained with a green viability dye. This product in particular is compatible with formaldehyde fixation. So I will talk briefly now about cell cycle assays. You are all familiar with the cell cycle phases. So just to remind you quickly that cells have different DNA content depending on which phase of the cell cycle they are at. So to look at the cell cycle profile, cells are stained with fluorescent dyes that bind to the double-stranded DNA and then are generally sorted in a flow cytometer. A cell cycle profile from a healthy cell population in culture will then look like this. Two main peaks can be on surf. The left one, which is called the G1 peak, contains the cells found in the G1 state, which are generally the majority of the cells in the population. The other peak is called G2M and will contain the cells that are ready to enter mitosis or in mitosis. In between these two peaks, we found the replicating cells, which are in S phase. Sometimes, left of the G1 peak, we can find what is called the sub-G1 population. And these are the cells that have lost some DNA, which is then an indication of cell death. It is a quick way to visualize cell death cells, um, but I will talk about the sub-G1 population in more detail in our following webinar. So here you can see how we use propidium iodide to stain HeLa cells that have been exposed to different conditions. The, group, <coughs> the control group, which is shown on panel A, shows the typical profile expected on healthy cells, so a big G1 peak and then a small G2M peak. Treatment with high concentration of thymidine, which is shown in panel B, interrupts the deoxynucleotide metabolism pathway and blocks DNA replication. So as, as the cells are not able to progress, most of them will be arrested in the G1S peak. On the other hand, nocodazole treatment, which is shown in panel C, inhibits microtubule polymerization which causes the cell to arrest in mitosis as the metaphase spindles cannot be formed. So here we see that most of the cells are found in the G2M peak. I will now introduce proliferation assays. <coughs> proliferation assays look at how the cells in the population are actively dividing. Because of this, Proliferation assays are commonly used as viability assays because, after all, a dividing cell is definitely a viable cell. So therefore, proliferation and viability assays are often put in the same package. And as I mentioned, many researchers will use proliferation assays to measure viability as well. <coughs> 
I will discuss briefly the different types of proliferation assays, which are <clears throat> detection of DNA synthesis, measuring cellular metabolic activity, dye dilution assays, and staining of proliferation proteins. The first type I will talk to you about is the assay based on detection of DNA synthesis. The most accurate cell proliferation assay is the direct quantification of the newly synthesized DNA strand by looking at the incorporation of a deoxyribonucleoside analog, which is generally known as thymidine analogs. This method can be used in multiple platforms such as immunohistochemistry, ELISA, or flow cytometry. And in this table, you, s you can see the most common thymidine analogs currently used by researchers. The original cell proliferation measurement is based on the incorporation of radioactive nucleosides such as titrated thymidine into DNA. This method was devised in the 1950s when the use of radioactive compounds was more extended. It's highly used nowadays because of the dangers of radioactivity use. And although it was introduced about 40 years ago, BRDU is still probably the most used and cited method to quantify DNA synthesis. The main limitations of BRDU are the requirement of a denaturation step to facilitate the detection molecule, the detection of the molecule by anti anti-BRDU antibodies. The denaturation can affect also the cell morphology and it limits the use with co-staining of fluorescent proteins. IDU and CIDU are modifications of BRDU and the detection principle is also based on antibodies. The limitations are the same ones as for BRDU. However, in comparison to BRDU, these analogs can be used together, which allows researchers to perform more complex experiments. EDU, which is mentioned at the bottom of the table, is the youngest member of this analog family. In comparison with the previous ones, it does not rely on antibodies and therefore does not require a denaturation step. The EDU incorporated into the new DNA strand can be detected by a copper-catalyzed reaction that uses a fluorescent dye. So here you can see a couple of examples of how to use BRDU to look at proliferation. <clears throat> On the top panel, you can see the proliferation of C23 fibroblast measured by using a BRDU ELISA assay. And you can see how the increase in the signal correlates with an increase in the number of cells. In the lower panel, you can see how BRDU was used to visualize proliferating cells in mouse in intestinal tissue section by immunohistochemistry. Proliferation can also be measured by looking at cellular metabolic activity. The working principle of looking at cellular metabolic activity has already been described in the viability section, so I will not go into detail here. Just to remind you that a dye gets modified by the activity of intercellular enzymes, and if the cell is proliferating, it will get a stronger signal than can be detected by either absorbance or fluorescence. <clears throat> Another method to look at cell proliferation is by dye dilution. Dye dilution assays are based on membrane permanent fluorescent dyes that are retained within the cells through subsequent rounds of cell divisions. So as the cell divide, the dye is roughly equally divided into daughter cells, and as these divide, the dye is then diluted throughout generations. Dye dilution is analyzed by flow cytometry, which allows the visualization of the fluorescent peaks which in turn enables the calculation of the number of original dividing cells. So here you can see how it works. The first generation of cells, which will be the stained cells, will show a highly fluorescent peak. As the cells divide, 
the intensity of the peak decreases, shifting the peak to the left, and so on, and so on, until the signal cannot be detected. So here you can see examples of dye exclusion assays. The top panel shows jerked cells labeled with CFSE, which is one of the most commonly used proliferation dyes. In fact, I think it was the first one that was um, described. So you can see how the peaks shift as the cell divisions take place. The main limitation of CFSE is that it can be easily a flux from the cell, potentially leading to a decrease in the fluorescence independent of the proliferation rate. The low panel shows jerked cells labeled with our next generation cytopainter proliferation reagent. The fluorescence <coughs> of this reagent can be detected for up to nine generations after staining and does not suffer efflux like CFSE. Also, one of the advantages of this dye is that it can be available in multiple colors, which allows co-staining with GFP. So I will now briefly cover how to study proliferation by looking at proliferating cells, proliferating proteins. There are some proteins that are only expressed when cells are proliferating, and the most commonly known and used our proliferation markers are CHI-67, PCNA, or MCM2. The proliferating proteins need to be detected in a spatial temporal context, and the way to do that is by using specific antibodies and tissue samples. These markers are mainly used for clinical diagnostic and prognostic studies, and therefore are not really suited to study a larger number of samples. And I will just briefly mention and talk to you about senescence. So if you remember the cell cycle diagram I showed you earlier in the webinar, these are cells that seem to be out of the typical, there are cells that seem to be out of the typical cell cycle profile. These are the cells that are in growth arrest a process which is generally known as quiescence. Growth arrest can be either reversible or irreversible. We talk about quiescence when the growth arrest phase is temporary and then can be reverted to growth phase when there are variable conditions in the media and in the surrounding area. Senescence refers to a permanent growth arrest where the cells remain metabolically active but do not divide. This phenomenon was first described in fibroblasts in culture, and the maximum number of cell divisions that a cell can undertake before becoming senescent is called Hayflick limit. Senescent cells can be differentiated from proliferating cells by having a flattened and large morphology. The current biological markers used to detect senescence are generally limited and not very specific. So, for example, <clears throat> increased expression of intracellular or secreted proteins such as P21, P16, IL-6, phosphorylated P38, SMRF2, or PGM have been cited in the literature as markers to senescence. These markers will generally be used in combination with one of the most established senescence markers, which is the senescence-associated beta-galactosidase protein. This is a lysosomal hydrolase which changes its optimal pH for activity when the cells become senescent, shifting from pH 4 to pH 6. The staining of beta-galactosidase activity is based on the transformation of the substrate X gal by the enzyme into a blue product. So now that we have reviewed all the different available, we need to decide which assay we're going to use. And the answer is really that it depends on what you want to detect. So let's say, for instance, if you want to check how healthy your cells are before starting an experiment, which is recommended, as we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, 
quick staining using dyes like propidium iodide or even triple blue with a light microscope and visualizing the cells might be enough. On the other hand, assessing viability or proliferation by metabolic activity will allow you to quantify the number of viable cells in your sample. If what you want to do is to check the effect of pharmacological compounds or mutations <coughs> that can have in the cells, you can look at viability and quantify the number of viable or inviable cells in comparison to the treated control. Similarly, you can look at proliferation or proliferation rate of the cells in comparison to the untreated control. Or, you might want to look at the cell cycle profile, as this will allow you to check whether a mutation or a compound, for example, is affecting the cell cycle progression. You can also detect whether cells are dying if there is an increase on in the sub-G1 population. If you see a decrease on proliferation, but there is no direct increase in death cells, you might want to check whether your cells have become senescent. If you want to monitor the effect that pharmacological compounds or mutation will have in a specific cell population over a long period of time, and at the same time, you want to monitor expression of surface markers, so, for example, dye exclusion assay is probably the best choice as it will allow you to do a co-staining with other intracellular or extracellular markers. And, of course, apart from what you want to detect, there are other considerations you have to keep in mind. The type of cell you are studying might dictate the type of viability or proliferation assay that you can use. Are you using primary or culture cells? Primary cells don't divide as quickly as culture cells, and they also tend to stop dividing earlier. Some assays, like metabolic activity, are easier to perform in adherent cells because they're generally done in a 96 well plate, while assays performed in a flow cytometry are generally easier to do with suspension cells. Or 3D cell cultures, for example, will be more difficult to stain than 2D cultures. If the model you are using has a defect in mitochondrial dehydrogenases, for example, it's best to avoid using metabolic activity-based assays since they require these enzymes. The type of instrumentation that you have available might also dictate the type of assay that you can do. For instance, whether you have a colorimetric or fluorimetric microplate reader or the appropriate filter for the plate reader or the flow cytometer or even the microscope. If you want to perform high throughput readings, for example, some assays like dye dilution might not be suitable. And there are all the factors to keep in mind when choosing a viability or proliferation assay because that's, for instance, the cost of the assay, whether it fits the total cost or the cost per assay, scalability, how long it's going to take you, and whether it gives you the ability of multiplexing or not. So just to conclude this webinar, I'd like to run you through some of the key points we've covered today. It is always best practice to ensure that the cells you are planning to use in an experiment are healthy and viable to avoid having to repeat the experiment later on. Cell viability and proliferation assays are often interchangeable and in the majority of cases, but not all, can be used for the same purpose. Dye dilution proliferation assays are best used when studying cells over various generations while also can be used to look at other cellular markers such as GFP expressing proteins. Cell cycle assays are best used when you're expecting to see an effect on the cell cycle progression. And senescence assays should be considered when cells in culture are not dividing as expected or when proliferation is reduced but there is no increase in cell death. But if there's 
only one thing I want you to remember today is, in fact, that the best way to assess which assay you can use to measure viability of proliferation is by thinking before you do the experiment. So what is the answer you want to get? What do you want to look at? So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm ready to answer any of the questions we have received. And remember that you can keep sending questions while I read out some of the questions. So one of the questions we had is, what are the main disadvantages of proliferation metabolic assays? Um, there are several disadvantages. Um, one is that because these assays depend on cellular activity, they can sometimes give false positives or false negatives. So for instance, um, when cells suffer damage and they start trying to overcome the stress, this generally re um, reflects on an increase in mitochondrial activity to try to get rid of the damage. So it might look, when you, especially when you're using low concentrations of drugs, that there is an increase in proliferation. And it doesn't mean that the cells are proliferating or being more viable. It's just that the enzymes are more active. So it's something that you have to keep in mind. Um, on the other hand, sometimes a decrease. For instance, um, medium consumption of the medium or excessive cell density tends to result in a shutdown of the mitochondrial functions, and then this can lead to an underestimation. Um, so another of the questions we have is, um, when conducting viability assays, that's the length, of, the length of time for which the cells are in culture before treatment matter. Um, there is, when they are proceeding to an anti six plate plate for determining cytotoxicity effect. Um, this is because different cells have different doping times and it's not factored into experiments. Well, the question is, the answer is yes. Um, partly because, for instance, as we just, as I've just said, if you plate your cells, you leave them for a long time, and then the plate, the well itself becomes very dense. This is going to affect your viability. Um, can also be, again, when these cells are, if you've played them, let's say, if you just took the stock from uh, the liquid nitrogen or their primary cells, and they're fairly fresh, they're more likely to start proliferating quicker than they're becoming at the end of their lifetime. Um, another question that we have, if you want to determine cell death rate, what are the alternatives to LDH? Um, that is a very good question. And actually, Neil, I might take it offline because I need to understand what do you exactly mean by cell death rate. If what you mean is how quick they are dying, or actually what you want to detect is compared to the control. So if it's all right, we'll follow that offline. Um, so I have a question. Say, um, I see a lot of papers using MTT as a mean to measure viability of the cells in culture. In my opinion, I think they are looking at mitochondrial functions rather than the entire cell. I wish to know your take on that. And that is actually completely correct. As I've just mentioned, MTT is based on the metabolic activity of the generally mitochondrial <coughs> dehydrogenases. So what they're measuring is the cellular activity. Well, usually, the reason why MTT or WST1 are generally used as viability is because there is a correlation. And of course, with any experiment, you always have to take it into the context that you're doing it. It's always necessary to have a control, which you have untreated. If possible, if you're looking, for instance, at a drug, try to use it with the solvent, and always have a positive control. So I think the reason why most people, um, we tend to use MTTs, uh, MTS, or WST1, is because they give a quick readout about the cells and because it allows to do it in a 96 or even in a 384 well plate, it's a very good way to looking very quickly whether your cells are dying or not. So I think that's why it's a very preferred method. Um, another question that I have is, when you plan a availability assay, do you have to starve cells overnight before adding the compound? 
Not necessarily. I think it would depend on the type of media, because for instance, um, reducing compounds like DTT or ascorbic acid, when they are used together with things like MTT or WST1, they can cause interference. So in that case, you might have to sort of starve your cells. Um, if you starve your cells, you're more likely to create a stress. So then your cells are probably in that pre-stress um, status. So I think then your cells might not be in a healthy population. So my preference would say no, but also depends on the type of the compounds you want to study. Obviously, the best answer in this case would be that have a look at your cells overnight, maybe do a pre-experiment without adding any compound compared to a non-starving cells and see how they affect. If you don't see any short-term effect, then I would say it might depend, but I would say my preference is, is not. Um, another question is, is there a number of dumbling is there like a number of doubling times after planting in 96 well played to allow before treatment cells for cytotoxicity assays? Um, I don't think there is. I think the reason why researchers tend to leave the plates overnight is just to ensure that all the plates, um, all the cells are attached to this, <coughs> are attached to the bottom of the plate. Um, some protocols, especially again with MTT, WC, some of them will ask you to aspirate your cells, and then, of course, if your cells haven't been fully attached, you'll lose them. Um, some of them you don't need to, but then if they're not fully attached, you might get some interference. So I think that's why generally the preferred method is to say leave them overnight to ensure they have been attached properly to the bottom of the plate. But it really um, depends after you. So... Um, there is a question, but it hasn't been fully written, so sorry. Um, Aitor, would you mind sending it back, because I only got half of it. <laughs> um, so we have another question in the meantime. Is the propidium iodide cell cycle assay sufficient to quantify the proportion of cells in each state, or is the BIDU method preferable? Um, the PI method is preferred in the lab to simplicity and is some sample preparation. Again, I think um, it depends. Um, with many types of very specific flow cytometers, like the cytox, they will allow you to look in the cells, each specific cell. So I think they're looking at different stuff. If what you want to quantify is the proportion of cells in different stages, I think a PI staining is probably the best option. What the BRDU is telling you is probably just telling you which cells are on the DNA in which the DNA is replicating. So you're literally just looking at that state of quantification. Um, if what you're looking is proliferation itself, then definitely BRDU is better. But if what you want to do is just quantify the proportion of cells into each state, I would say a PI staining is probably better. So I have a question saying, I have opposing results with Tripan Blue and LDH assay. Which should I trust? With Tripan Blue, I saw a decrease in, LD in cell death following compound treatment, but with LDH, I saw an increase on cell death. Um, I think, <laughs> again, um, maybe, Michael, we could take this off offline and we could look into more details. Um, I think part of it... LDH, again, after all, is a sort of metabolic reading because what you're reading is the, met is the leakage of the LDH activity. Um, so you might be over-reading or underestimating. Um, no, uh, in this case, you would be under uh, overestimating the cell death. Uh, with triplum blue, what you might be doing is actually if, you, um, if your cells are already dead and they're fragmented, you might be missing that. So I will try to follow you on that to get more specific response. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let me see. I'm trying. Sorry, apologies. I'm trying to read the small print. Um, another question is: What's the best assay to differentiate between cytotoxic and cytostatic effect? 
Um, yes, we haven't talked about cytostatic effect because many of the researchers, they're only interested to looking at the cytotoxic effect. But things like clonogenic assays, which is, for instance, the crystal violet of staining of um, growing colonies of cells over a long period of time, is one of the best ones. And that's because you can kind of look at your cells growing over a long period of time and then stain them afterwards. And that helps you to identify, you can see the long-term difference between reversible kind of cell death arrest and then whether the cells are actually dying. So the question from we were missing before is, when you're treating cells with different drug concentrations, the differences in culture media provided by the diluted drugs can affect the data. Um, it could be, I mean, culture media, things like phenyl red sometimes interferes with some colorimetric assays. And again, because colorimetric assay, what it does is it measures the changes in color and the absorbance. The absorbance might be affected if there might be, for instance, some, precipi some small precipitates or contaminations in the cell. So that could be, it could actually affect. So in this case, obviously, a fluorometric assay might be preferred if you're expecting um, some interferences. <laughs> 